Hello and welcome to today's latest offering of continuing professional education. I'm Mitch Arpit from the law firm of Tribler, Arpit and Meyer in Chicago and currently chair of Eagle International Associates. This webinar is brought to you by Eagle and is just one of a series of conferences and panel discussions dealing with important issues and challenges of significance to claims professionals and defense lawyers uh, around the world. We're really delighted that you've joined us today for this program. Before we begin, uh, let me give you a quick word about Eagle and who we are and uh, point you to some additional resources that we have available for you. Eagle is an association of defense lawyers and insurance adjusters throughout the United States, Canada, and parts of Western Europe. After review, excuse me, after review, we admit one or two members uh, from each, uh, from firms in each of the various states and provinces and from other countries. We all work with insurance companies, corporate litigation departments and risk managers and devote most of our practice to the service of companies and their insureds in defense of claims. Eagle members are dedicated to the service of the insurance industry, to providing highest quality professional service and offering additional value to our clients through sharing our resources, offering five or six live conferences a year when safety permits us to, to do so, and uh, when it doesn't, to uh, offering programs, or uh, sorry, uh, offering programs like this on a remote basis when people can't travel or we can't gather together safely. We also publish uh, articles several times a year and have compendiums and publications uh, that deal with national surveys on important issues. One such example of, of the publications that we have would be a bad faith compendium uh, where you can click online, get to a specific jurisdiction, and uh, be brought into a discussion of the governing law in that area with links available to the statutes that uh, may govern your claim. So uh, if you visit us at our website, which is www.eagle-law.com, uh, you can find listings of programs such as this, some of the other uh, remote programs that we're doing, uh, and, and also of the various publications we have that are available to you. You could also click on and get to know the firms who are members of Eagles, the individuals who are active in the organization, who we are, what we do, where we're located. We're happy to talk to you. Our Eagle members are happy to talk to you. So feel free if you have a question, uh, you need help finding somebody or something, uh, give, us, give us a call. We're happy to address or send us an email. And uh, we're confident that through our vast network, we can help you find solutions to problems and uh, get you answers to whatever questions you may have. Again, that uh, website is www.eagle-law.com. So again, thanks today for joining us. We hope you enjoy the program. And I will turn you over at this point. I should add one other thing. Uh, in addition to the live programs that we do in various spots around the country, one of the services that we have offered in the past and continue to do so, uh, are programs specifically for a, a client or a company. So if you have a, an issue that you would love to see us come in and, and have us address for you or your, your colleagues at your company, we're happy to do so. We, we come from around the country, uh, happy to visit with you and share uh, items and issues for discussion, put on panel programs and uh, deal directly with you. If you have any uh, thoughts along those lines, feel free to contact me, uh, our, our executive director, Terry Napolitani, or any Eagle member listed on the uh, webpage, and we'll be happy to talk with you about that. So again, thanks uh, for joining us. Enjoy the program. And I will now turn you over to our conferences chair, Lindsay, Wood Lindsay Woodrow from the Waldeck firm in Minnesota. Waldeck firm is our Eagle member for the states of Minnesota and Wisconsin. Lindsay. Thanks, Mitch. As Mitch just mentioned, I am the Eagle seminar conferences chair um, for Eagle this year, and I want to welcome you to Eagle's webinar platform. We hope that you find this informative and useful. This particular webinar that you've chosen to watch today was part of a longer five-hour in-house seminar uh, that Eagle put together for an insurance company. And so you may see or hear some glitches 
or references to other subjects and other panels. We certainly apologize for that, but we wanted to bring this program to you broken down into individual webinars so that you could pick and choose what's relevant to your work and to your interests. So with that, let's get uh, to what you all clicked on to watch today. Brought to you by five separate EGLE members, we have COVID-19 limiting your exposure. Uh, the panel that you're going to hear from today includes Jason Campbell. He is our EGLE member from Arkansas. Uh, my partner, Ted Waldeck uh, from Minnesota and Wisconsin. Paul Finnamore, our EGLE member from Maryland. Jeremy Hawk, the EGLE member from Mississippi and David Hayes, the EGLE member from Georgia. And so I think you guys are going to find this uh, really cutting edge and up to date, and we hope that you enjoy the COVID-19 webinar. Uh, I'm Jason Campbell, zooming in from the offices of Anderson, Murphy & Hopkins in Little Rock, Arkansas. Uh, I'm joined uh, as a co-moderator by Ted Waldeck of the Waldeck Firm in Minneapolis, Minnesota. Hello. Um, Ted is uh, licensed to practice in Minnesota, Wisconsin, and North Dakota. And for our COVID panel today, we have a mix of uh, Southeastern Conference lawyers, uh, which are going forward with their football season, and Big Ten uh, lawyers, which, depending upon the day of the week, may or may not be playing football uh, this year. Uh, we have Jeremy Hawk of Taylor Wellens Firm in Mississippi. We have David Hayes of Owen Gleaton, Egan Jones, and Sweeney uh, in Atlanta. Uh, David is licensed to practice in both Alabama and Georgia. And then finally, we have uh, Paul Finnamore of the Pesson Katz Law Firm in Maryland. He is licensed to practice in Maryland and D.C. I'd like to begin our topic with a shameless plug for EGLE. Uh, back in May of 2020, our Publications Committee and our Emerging Issues Committee put together a 50-state compendium uh, publication which was distributed uh, entitled uh, Courts in COVID-19. It is uh, still available on our website. Uh, if we were in person, we would be handing that out to you, but uh, you can obtain those materials through our website. Uh, that was a, an early effort on the part of Eagle to educate our clients on the individual state's responses to the pandemic and the impact on the courts, uh, businesses, and schools and churches in the states in which we practice. As indicated in that compendium, uh, the approaches taken in our various states have varied quite a bit. Uh, so we're going to expand on that here today. Obviously, the four months have passed. There have been quite a few changes. And in our roundtable discussion, our panelists are going to discuss how our states have been affected by the COVID-19 pandemic, uh, how we've all attempted to open up for business. Uh, we are going to expand on what Shay was visiting about. The, this issue of immunity and will provide specific discussion of the applicable uh, civil immunity provisions that have been implemented in our states, if applicable, to stem this flood of COVID claims. Uh, we will then talk about the specific impact that we've seen on uh, churches and schools and the efforts made in reopening of churches and schools and the procedural recommendations that have been handed down and the guidelines handed down by our states and what we've recommended to our clients. And then finally, we're going to move to uh, the impact that this pandemic has had on our court system and efforts to uh, reopen the court system. So with that being said, I will uh, ask that Jeremy Hawk, uh, who is our Mississippi attorney, uh, lead us off with a discussion of how the pandemic was initially addressed in Mississippi and whether his state has implemented any immunity protections to aid in business reopening. Thank you, Jason. We're just glad that um, we're not, we dodged a hurricane today and we certainly keep those people in Florida and Alabama that are dealing with um, the hurricane Sally that's a, uh, inundating them with flood and rain right now. Um, with regard to COVID 
and immunity in Mississippi and Louisiana. Both states have implemented immunity statutes uh, that protect healthcare workers, um, that protect businesses, governmental agencies. Uh, in that same line, I think it protects churches and schools. Uh, as schools, you know, are certainly an extension uh, of the government in those states uh, from civil uh, actions in Mississippi and Louisiana. Um, as Shay was stating, um, any type of malice or willful conduct or reckless disregard could accept those businesses out of the civil immunity. So as long as the restaurants, the schools, the churches follow the guidelines that are in place by our governors and by the CDC, uh, I, I feel that those immunities will uh, continue to uh, hold on both, uh, with both states. Now, with regard to not getting too far afield, I, I do believe in looking at the current body of law in both states that employees that contract um, COVID can file and make a traditional workers' compensation claim against their employer. Uh, however, I still think it's treated like any type of occupational disease uh, and the burden will be a difficult burden to make uh, and the employee will have to prove that they contracted COVID at their employee, at their employer. Uh, and I think in both states, uh, that's a really high burden and that's a really tough assignment for anybody, you know, because, you know, just like all of us, you know, when you come home from work, I mean, you go to the grocery store, you go to a baseball game, you go to do other things with your kids. And, you know, it's, it's just really hard to nail it down um, where you actually uh, uh, were exposed to it and where you received it. But I, I do think that uh, there will be a workers' compensation actions filed in both states. Um, you know, uh, if those cases can be documented and the burdens can be met, you know, I think that it's a, it's going to be an acceptable claim. Uh, however, you know, I think it's a really difficult burden, you know, at the end of the day. Thank you, uh, Jeremy. David, what's going on in Georgia and Alabama? So in, in Georgia, um, which I'm planning to spend most of the time on, you may remember in the, the height of the pandemic in April and May, Georgia was one of the early states that committed to trying to reopen. And with that came a flurry of executive orders um, that were some of the first of their kind in the nation. And I think the easiest way to explain where we are and what the future may look like is just to give a brief history of those. Um, in early April, there was an executive order issued that covered healthcare professionals and facilities and really a number of entities that may be related to healthcare entities, uh, imaging centers, uh, laboratories, uh, obviously nursing homes. And the, uh, the governor with his order uh, put what we've heard about already, put the willfulness, willful misconduct, gross negligence, um, put that on these facilities and providers um, as being the, the standard that they would have to meet. So in other words, uh, raising the, the, the bar. Um, that was quickly followed by uh, later in April, Georgia tried to do the, well, follow through with a phase one reopening. And part of that was another uh, flurry of executive orders. And the one here that's most relevant is uh, an order that essentially provided blanket immunity for all businesses that were part of the phase one. And those are the quote unquote essential businesses, which of course were healthcare, but then um, construction businesses were included, legal services were included, um, business service businesses were included in that. And that was an order that provided blanket immunity for um, 
I mean, the quote is, these ent entities will not be held liable to any other individual, partnership, association, corporation, in any action seeking legal or equitable relief. Um, but the key was, if you're following the phase one executive orders, which I think all told there were about a dozen executive orders. Um, and so this really hasn't been tested yet, but it's evolved. This um, executive order that was phase one, the blanket immunity for essential businesses expired in July. Um, and with it, in perfect timing, the legislature passed in a special session a uh, Georgia COVID-19 Pandemic Business Safety Act. And this is legislation that um, has also not yet been tested, but it's very visible legislation and not because of um, how relevant it is, but because a, a key part of this legislation sets a rebuttable presumption of assumption of the risk if businesses that are open print a uh, pre-typed sign and put it on their front door. And these have sprouted up all over the state, really. I mean, every business that is open now, retail business, food, uh, restaurant establishment, professional office, literally every business has this on the front door. And it is, um, I'm not gonna read it to you, but it basically says any person entering these premises waives all civil liability for COVID claims. This legislation provided that if you put that sign up that you get a rebuttable presumption of assumption of a risk in a, if a COVID claim is brought. And of course a COVID claim is a claim related to um, uh, becoming infected from visiting a business or business services and so on. Um, you could either do that, put that sign up, which is probably the easiest way, easiest way to prove that this uh, presumption is there, or you can print that on a receipt uh, or on a ticket if it's someplace where you're issuing tickets for admission. And that, uh, that is, uh, will cover all COVID claims until July of next year. So the, any claims uh, accruing up until July of next year are gonna be governed under that legislation. The, the, the governors continue to issue executive orders which um, compound the issues. Uh, as I'm sure you've seen in many of your states, there are pages and pages and pages of measures that should be taken. And you know where we're standing now is that there has been no real uh, uh, way to test that, to find out if these liability provisions um, are, are gonna have the intended effect. Thank you, David. Uh, Paul Fenimore, what are you seeing in Maryland? In Maryland, we do not yet have any business specific immunities related to COVID-19. I think Shay mentioned that there are certain immunities available for healthcare practitioners or health, healthcare facilities, um, kind of going along with what David just talked about. Uh, Maryland's Governor Hogan has been pretty aggressive in the way that he's handled the COVID-19 um, crisis. We are only just entering phase three now, which means that we do have a number of um, businesses that are now able to be opened again. For example, movie theaters can be opened at 50 percent um, and as well as some other uh, businesses. We've had dining outside for a while. Dining inside is starting to be permitted. So it's been um, it's been pretty well controlled by uh, Governor Hogan in terms of how he handled the crisis. Because he did um, declare that it was a catastrophic health emergency, our uh, immunity rules for healthcare providers did kick in and healthcare providers who are acting in good faith, caring for COVID-19 related reasons may very well fit in the, in the immunity standards. It's interesting though, because um, the medical community has somewhat warned healthcare providers that they shouldn't view this as a complete um, 
liability waiver by the state because it's specific to COVID-19 treatment. If it's not related to COVID-19 treatment, the immunity provisions would not apply. But we have not yet seen an, an expansion to the business community generally for COVID-19. Um, I agree with both David and Jeremy. I think that we'll see a rise in workers' compensation cases. Um, at this point, I've seen in other states, but I haven't seen yet in Maryland, that there is an attempt to try to circumvent the exclusive remedy under our workers' compensation law by making claims of either you know, gross negligence or intentional conduct by failing to institute some of the CDC guidance and so forth. But I think as we see it happen in other states, I, I anticipate that we'll start to see that happen in Maryland as well. Thank you, Paul. Uh, Ted, what are you seeing in the frozen tundra that is Minnesota, Wisconsin, and North Dakota? Yeah, not quite frozen yet. Thanks, Jason. And uh, thank you to everybody at Brotherhood. Hello from Minnesota. Um, one of the things, as far as legislation that got passed here in Minnesota, Minnesota actually took action uh, very early and as early as April of 2020 to pass a, an important law, and that was to allow uh, off-site liquor sales to restaurants that previously weren't licensed to do that. Uh, Minnesota recognized that a lot of people were going to be at home and would need to get alcohol easily and made sure to act quickly on that. They did not, however, pass any laws to protect businesses uh, through immunity. Uh, our situation is similar to what Paul just discussed in Maryland. Uh, there are obviously protections in place for healthcare workers, um, but so far a number of bills have been introduced, but nothing passed that would extend immunity uh, to businesses. Some of the bills that have been introduced include bills that would limit liability to uh, companies that are producing equipment uh, for COVID-19. I think Shea spoke on that earlier. Uh, there was also, um, there's also a law that, or a bill that's been introduced that would limit lawsuits um, for personal injury to individuals who suffered from serious injuries related to COVID-19, meaning it would preclude claims for individuals who had not been hospitalized, um, or who had been asymptomatic. Um, so we'll be interested to see what happens with that. Uh, one other bill that we saw, again, no action has been taken yet. It has not been enacted, but would be um, protections for premises claims where the premises are in substantial compliance with whatever the local guidelines are. So one of the things we saw is recently the Minnesota Department of Health had gone around to various restaurants and bars in Minnesota, approximately a little over 100, and about half or more of those they found were in compliance with the rules, which it, if you looked at the news related to it appeared to be they were optimistic about that, uh, but that means there are a lot of businesses out there that were not in compliance. Uh, and of course, there's exposure there potentially should something happen. Uh, we've Jeremy talked briefly about the difficulty of tracing some of these claims, and I think we'll get we'll get into that. However, it's certainly something that's not impossible. Uh, if you've ever dealt with cases involving salmonella, E. coli, things like that, they are able to trace, at least when there are instances of a, a, like a super spreader event is a term that's being used with COVID. Uh, so we're following those in Minnesota, but no uh, immunity laws passed to protect businesses at this time. Um, in Wisconsin, uh, kind of the big highlight, the big storyline out of Wisconsin was after the governor had passed the mandatory stay at home law, the Supreme Court of Wisconsin overturned that stating that he didn't have the authority to do so. What's interesting about that is the decision essentially then turned it to the 72 counties in Wisconsin to create a patchwork type regulatory scheme for how they would deal with COVID-19. So this will be very interesting in that if you get a Wisconsin claim, a Wisconsin lawsuit, not only is it going to be a very fact specific case, but it may be driven by the very county uh, that you're in, which is obviously going to be uh, unique. Um, North Dakota, similar situations. Again, uh, things still under consideration there. 
Uh, but it, it'll be interesting to see what types of claims we have, how, if they come forward. In, in states like Minnesota and Wisconsin, there are already a number of protections in place for individuals like healthcare professionals. Um, the question will be what types of things are we seeing down the road right now? This is obviously fresh in everyone's mind. People are aware of the difficulty in, in managing the, this evolving nature of COVID. Uh, but what happens years down the line as, as these claims start to pop up, if they pop up? Thank you, Ted. I'll shed a little bit of light on what I'm seeing here in Arkansas. Um, we did not issue any type of stay at home or shelter in place order in Arkansas. Um, Arkansas is currently at about seven, 70,000 confirmed cases and 1,000 deaths. Uh, we are ranked 12th in the number of COVID cases uh, per capita. Obviously, the southern states have been hit pretty hard with uh, uh, per capita cases. Um, we are unique in that we are one of two states in which uh, there was uh, promulgated civil immunity for businesses, premises claims, for COVID-19 claims through executive order rather than legislative process. Um, March of uh, this year, our governor, Asa Hutchinson, issued an emergency declaration. He followed that up um, in June 15th with an emergency proclamation, basically extending premises business immunity uh, that does apply to churches, uh, any type of organization for, our, for any civil claims uh, resulting from COVID exposure. Um, as Shay mentioned, uh, this does not apply to reckless or willful conduct. Um, there is a presumption in the declaration that if a business is substantially complying or at least attempting to comply with our state department of health guidelines or governor's recommendations, then they are deemed to uh, not be engaging in willful or reckless conduct. Um, the governor also has extended uh, our workers' compensation statute and laws. Uh, we previously had a general disease exclusion uh, in which anyone claiming a general disease uh, could not make a workers' compensation claim. Our governor has uh, made an exception because of COVID. And now, as long as a worker can uh, make a uh, claim of a causal connection to the premises, they are allowed to seek workers' compensation uh, benefits, and, and that's what I anticipate to be the primary uh, source of any claims here in Arkansas. So that's what we're seeing here in Arkansas, not, not many claims um, outside of the workers' compensation arena. Um, Ted, I'm going to turn it over to you for our next uh, subtopic. Yeah, so uh, we're, we're now going to talk about churches and schools, because as we know, uh, churches, church services are, are taking place in person again, uh, at least where I'm located, um, and school is back in session, which has been a relief for some and a headache for others, and depending on where you are, what kind of school your kids are going to, um, you're going to be looking at different situations uh, <clears throat> in Minnesota. Uh, public schools are, are not meeting in person. And so we've seen a lot of people actually who, who have a strong desire to get their kids in school in person, moving them to private schools, Catholic schools and other religious institutions saw an, a major uptick in, uh, in applications for new students uh, because they're meeting in person. And so with that, we're seeing uh, potential exposure, obviously. Um, and we, we're going to talk briefly about what we're seeing in our various states with regard to uh, issues that may arise uh, because we're meeting in person, uh, what types of things we're seeing these institutions do to help limit liability, and, and what to expect down the road. Uh, so with that framework in mind, Jeremy Hawk, uh, what can you tell us about what's going on in Mississippi and Louisiana with schools and churches? Sure. Um, churches are, 
for the most part back opening and I think now it can operate at 75% capacity. Um, they still have to maintain their certain social distancing. Um, we went for the first time this past Sunday and it's really different. They're doing a lot of very, uh, very uh, different things to make you feel safe while you're there and to, to prevent you from contracting um, the COVID. Uh, with regards to schools, uh, it's a school district by school district decision. Uh, the majority of the schools in Mississippi um, are back in session. Um, some are going alternating days. Um, our academies, our parochial schools have been open for about a month. Uh, my school district, my kids uh, just went back um, a, a week ago. And it's been a great day in my house that I needed to get them out of my house and I needed to get them into a school so they can eat their food and they won't eat my food. Um, but my wife's a teacher and I can tell you over the summer, um, there was countless meetings, there's countless materials. Um, the school districts here are taking every appropriate measure to make sure that the teachers and the children are safe. Now, with regards to liability for those schools going back in session, uh, I do believe that the immunities may very well apply to those school districts as long as you adhere to your standard of care. Now, that standard of care is always changing. Um, it's a moving target. Um, but it, as long as you're, you have a written set of guidelines that the school district is following, and the teachers and the administration follow those guidelines, I feel that um, the immunity will, will continue to attach. Now, um, that's, it's still, I mean, if somebody files a lawsuit against a school district for contracting COVID, it's going to be expensive. Those school districts are gonna to have to pay fees and, and pay attorneys. If you're self-insured to a certain extent, um, or even if you're insured, I, I mean, that, these are gonna be expensive cases to try. There's gonna be a lot of discovery. There's gonna be a lot of investigation. Uh, the schools can contact trace. So the schools should have some adequate defenses in place uh, with regard to the lawsuits. Um, and the, the claims will still be hard to prove. It, it kind of goes to what I was talking about uh, in the comp world, um, that the, the, the child or the parent still has the burden of proof to, to, to show that he or she con contracted COVID while he or she was at school and while they were not, you know, at a soccer game or at a baseball game, you know, or at church or at home or somewhere else. Um, and I still think that uh, that's going to be a, a burden that is um, uh, really hard to prove. Now, note that some districts have looked into waivers uh, in Mississippi and Louisiana waivers are not really worth the paper that they're printed on because of the unequal bargaining power uh, contained with the school district. Um, you know, essentially saying if you don't sign this waiver, then you can't go to school here. Um, so I don't think waivers are an option for school districts to, you know, to preserve uh, liability and exposure. Uh, however, uh, boiling all that down, I, I do believe that if you have guidelines with school district, if the teachers and the administration follow the guidelines, I do believe that if your state has immunity, that that immunity will attach. Now, if your state doesn't have immunity, uh, I do believe those are some really good defenses. And I think that the child will have a very difficult time meeting his or her burden of proof to uh, you know, be able to sustain a cause of action against the school district um, however, it's going to be expensive and it's going to, you know, the school district or the insurer is going to have costs, you know, litigation expenses associated with that. All right. Thank you, Jeremy. David, uh, what can you tell us about Georgia? Thanks, Ted. Similar to what, uh, going off Jeremy, you know, it's, we're open for business, uh, as far as schools and churches go. Uh, it, most of the schools are open in Georgia. Uh, churches just recently were allowed to open. Um, 
when you get to the uh, cities, Atlanta city schools are not open, which is the largest school district in the state. Um, but just by number of districts, the vast majority of the, the school districts are open. Um, you know, the, the question is going to be in looking at claims, we've got immunity, as I discussed in Georgia, but what it gets confusing fast because how do we protect that immunity? And if you look at the various executive orders and you look at the legislation um, that I mentioned earlier, there are so many guidelines that attach. And one way it can be read is that the immunity is granted if you meet the guidelines of the whatever order it is. And I was looking uh, to discuss this and let's just talk about schools. There are at least four sets of orders and guidelines that would um, arguably control a school case, just a negligence case. And it, the questions, does immunity apply? Well, you've got orders from the governor that have are written in such a way that say a school shall do this. And then there's a list of 10 things that need to be done. And those are sort of the common sense things like you need to screen workers for COVID symptoms. Well, the, there are also Department of Public Health guidelines that can be read as being mandatory for reopening of schools. <coughs> those, they have a lot of common requirements, but there are some differences. You've got department uh, for, for child care, daycares, that I'll bunch into the school conversation. You've got Department of Early Care here in Georgia that has issued guidelines. Uh, you've also got the obvious, the Department of uh, the Board of Education, the State Board of Education, that have issued guidelines. And looking at some of these, uh, you know, it's the question, I guess when you get a case in the door is, well, do we have immunity? And that hasn't been tested yet. And I think the first question when you, when you get that case in is, well, which set of these guidelines applies and have we checked all the boxes? To give you a sort of specific example, there's in schools under the Department of Public Health guidelines, masks are not required. Social distancing is not required. Those are recommendations. Requirements are staying at home if you're sick uh, or if you've been exposed. I mean, to state the obvious. Uh, but we're just talking about immunity, remember? Uh, the next question is going to be, okay, well, if immunity doesn't apply, then let's look at the negligence standard. What's the standard of care? Well, the guidelines may say that social distancing is not required and masks are not required. But as we all know from a simple negligence case, what's the standard of care? What's, uh, what's reasonable? Uh, is it reasonable to socially distance students? It may be in certain schools, it may not in other schools. I mean, it's, I've got one child who's in preschool, so he's uh, two and there's no way to socially distance him from his classmates. Um, but on the flip, an elementary child, or middle schooler, there is a way to socially distance, or at least to try. Those are the kinds of questions uh, that are going to be raised here in Georgia and probably most places. Um, another quick example is daycares. There are requirements issued by the Department of Early Care that are parents are not allowed inside of the facility. They can only drop their children off at the front door. That's a requirement. Um, there's a requirement that uh, hands must be washed after outdoor play. Um, but then again, there's a set of recommendations, which are masks and the social distancing. So it's, it's going to be interesting. The impact, it, on, the impact today on the operation of schools and daycares and churches is that they are they have spent a ton of money talking to lawyers, not necessarily insurance lawyers, but compliance lawyers. How do we get this school open? And what do we need to do? And that's cost a lot of money and it's taken a lot of time. Uh, there's obviously a lot of safety measures that have been put in place. Um, but then when we move forward to 
liability and personal injury, or I haven't even touched on workers' comp, and I don't think I'll leave that, but just personal injury suits, it, it's going to be, is there immunity? Have we followed the orders and the guidelines to protect the immunity? Um, and if there's not, then what's the standard of care that we're going to be held to under a negligence case? And as Jeremy said, you know, I haven't seen it yet. You, we've all been talking about it. I haven't seen a string of lawsuits in Georgia. I think there's been one personal injury suit that I've seen that's, that's a nursing home uh, for COVID contraction. But, you know, is this coming? And if it does, it's going to be a very fact intensive uh, process. True. Ed. Good. All right. Well, thank you, David. Uh, Paul, what can you tell us about Maryland or the East Coast? Well, for Maryland, Ted, it's interesting. Um, our public schools are closed. Um, it's, this is uh, an issue that's very close to home for me because my wife is actually an enrollment and development director for Catholic school in our area. Both the Archdiocese of Washington and Baltimore announced immediately that they were going to open for in in person classes time. Ted, to your point, it was interesting. I think my wife had 400 inquiries in the day that the uh, Archdiocese of Baltimore and announced that it would be opening and the public school said that they would be closing. So um, our governor is very interested in getting schools back into session, but um, at this point, uh, the, the, school, the public schools are not yet back. It's all distance learning. Um, as far as uh, social distancing, as I've said, our governor has been pretty strong on that. So, so social distancing is required in schools. We also are required to wear masks, so the children are all wearing masks in schools that are open. Um, I also happen to serve on a board of a, of a girls' Catholic high school in the area. They chose to open. Interestingly, because the high schools are different than the elementary schools, it's on a school-by-school -school basis, and so um, we've seen some schools open and some not. Um, from an employment perspective, we've seen very, um, kind of interesting and varied results from faculty who are being told to come back. And uh, in my view, it seems as if um, some of the, the generalized fears of returning to work are not unique to schools. They're probably, you know, common to all businesses. And we've seen some help from the Small Business Administration on how employers can avoid um, continued unemployment claims because of the generalized fear of returning to work. My experience with different clients on this topic is the ones who have been in front of it, who've been putting out information to their employees early on, explaining what the guidelines are that they intend to institute in the office and compliance with CDC guidelines, maybe some plexiglass and things of that sort, that they have been able to address some of these generalized fear issues better than others. Um, but now that, now that our schools are back in session, it's, it's, um, it's a strange new world in schools. For example, um, for the elementary schools that aren't in session, the children aren't allowed to bring balls to school because that would be passing germs from one to another. So for the most part, you'd go see children in a, in a, in, in an outdoor playground sitting around together as opposed to in the past running around and having a good time together. So COVID-19 certainly is having a, a, an impact all across the board. Um, and uh, we don't have those general business immunities. So uh, generally speaking, the advice that we give to clients who are opening a business or you know, on, the, on the board side to the school is do your best, as I think David just talked about, do your best to, to comply with the guidelines that are out there. Use your common sense. If the CDC is telling uh, you know, the general community what to do to be safe, then that's very likely going to be the standard of care moving forward. But we're not going to have a generalized immunity for schools moving forward in, in Maryland. Good. And I don't really suspect it would be any different in DC to, to that matter. Yeah, well, in, and up here we're seeing, it's interesting, uh, as we're talking about private schools, Paul, um, the the private schools here i mean one of the the issues and and this could cut both ways i suppose is 
while some of these private schools may be well funded, a lot of these private schools, um, religious schools, Catholic schools uh, needed to open, uh, did not have the financial wherewithal to be to be out of to not be doing in person classes. I mean, the reality was is those families weren't going to keep their kids or a portion of them weren't going to keep their kids in those schools and continue to pay tuition to do distance learning, certainly at, at certain levels. Um, we're seeing a mix up here where um, some of our schools, as I mentioned, some of the private schools are in person full time. The public schools are either doing completely remote learning or we're seeing some hybrid models where the children are going into school a couple of days a week. And, and what, what I saw from, uh, from my own perspective and in dealing with my kids going back to school is we got information early from the school as far as what protocols were going to be in place. The teachers were trained on, on how to adequately enforce those new rules. You know, they worked with state and local agencies on what to do. My children had their temperature taken before they enter the building. They're wearing masks when they're in there. Uh, there's social distancing in the classrooms. They've they've reconnoitered the classrooms to work that way, but you know that's the solution right now. And as we've it, the, a thread through all of this has been that this is an evolving issue. Uh, flu season is about to be upon us, and up here that's going to be a big deal because in Minnesota, Wisconsin, North Dakota, we're inside all the time in the winter. I mean, there are certain days where you just can't be out there. Kids can't be outside waiting for buses, etc. Uh, so it'll be interesting to see what happens there. You know, I, I had mentioned this earlier, but we're dealing with this right now. And I think that if you were to, to pool people and, and look at what might be a prospective jury and say, did somebody take reasonable measures today while we're in the middle of this? And you can see that they've looked at local guidelines, uh, that they've put measures in place to help keep people safe, that anybody's going to understand that things can go wrong and that this is a difficult situation. In, in Minnesota, where you have a six-year statute of limitations on negligence claims, what I worry about is what happens five years down the road when a claim comes out and now people are, are Monday or uh, Monday morning quarterbacking what could have been done? Were these the best measures at the time? Was the school just trying to open because it was a financial decision as opposed to a safety decision? Um, were the teachers really trained on all of this? I mean, all of this happened pretty quickly. So there's probably decent arguments that could be made down the road, I suppose, of how well trained were these individuals who admittedly are not going to be medical professionals, but just people doing the best they can. Um, and those Ted, are, to that point, yeah. to that point, things are evolving constantly. I mean, if you look at what the CDC is saying a few months ago, there would be symptoms that weren't even on the list that now are considered to be COVID-19 symptoms. That's we also right. have uh, recently now we're learning that a positive test, that someone who has a positive test will be positive for 90 days. Yeah. So what does that mean in terms of allowing people who test positive to come back to work? So one of the takeaways, I think, for schools for um, you know, for churches, for business period, is that you've got to be really nimble and you better be paying attention to what's coming out all the time because it's changing. Yeah, well, and I, yeah, I agree with that. Uh, I mean, and that's it. If, if you think your job is done now because you put a plan into place, uh, the hope would be that people are understanding this is likely something that's going to have to evolve along with the, the virus and what, what we're learning. Um, just sticking with the current plan if things change isn't going to be uh, sufficient. And then of course, just one final thing before I, I turn it over to Jason uh, to tell us what's going on in, in his neck of the woods um, is, again, we've been talking about the difficulty of tracing these and that is obviously gonna be an issue. Jeremy, Jeremy talked about that. But you're not just dealing with the people in the school, you're dealing with the people who then they go interact with outside of the school. And so waivers were mentioned at one point and, and the enforceability of those is gonna be somewhat of a question mark anyway. But individuals who are not in the school aren't signing waivers. And if they're made ill, because what we're finding is it's really not children who are the ones, at least at this point that we have any information on that, that appear to be struggling to any great degree, but, but they're interacting with grandparents and other people who may have health issues. 
And how does that impact them in the event that somebody down the road were ever able to trace something uh, to an outbreak at a school or a church? Uh, with, with that in mind, Jason, what can you tell us about what's going on in Arkansas? Thanks, Ted. Uh, starting with schools, we, like uh, I think David indicated in, in his state, we've got a mixed approach. Uh, it's a district by district determination of whether there's going to be uh, live uh, in-person schooling as opposed to remote learning. Uh, one of the issues we have in Arkansas is we are number 50 out of 50 states in uh, internet connectivity. So uh, there's a lot of districts that don't have an option to educate children. Uh, and, and are forced to uh, get them back into the class. Now, uh, there's been a lot of creative ways they're doing this, uh, uh, you know, uh, having, uh, uh, you know, earlier times, later times, split schedules, uh, shields, and, and things of that sort. But we do have a mask mandate now in place in Arkansas, which is helping us get some of these numbers uh, turned around as far as COVID cases. Um, but it really depends upon the district. Here in uh, Central Arkansas, the public schools in Little Rock, uh, they are uh, uh, requiring children to be attending in person. So that's the way I've, I've uh, uh, seen it handled here in Arkansas. As far as churches, we are now in the second phase of a three stage phase reopening uh, plan in Arkansas. Uh, remember our governor uh, issued an executive order uh, which provided for immunity uh, for any organizations, including churches, uh, in the event that uh, guidelines were followed or an attempt at following guidelines were made. Uh, what our governor has done is issued through the Department of Health some very specific and very detailed uh, reopening guidelines and procedures uh, which are in place and have been uh, initially enacted or initially put out in May of 2020, most recently updated July the 2nd. So in Arkansas, looking out towards uh, the, the potential for claims, I think there's a good argument here um, that uh, churches and schools for that matter, if they go through the specific detailed guidelines put out by the governor, uh, there, there will be entitlement or a good argument at least uh, for rebuttable presumption of immunity for the uh, churches and, and both the school system. So, um, you know, in this phase two, currently, um, you know, uh, currently the, the Sunday schools are, are reopening. Uh, we're still having uh, face coverings requirement. Social hours are coming back into play as well. Uh, a lot of my clients did like the Facebook Live um, congregation and um, uh, live streams of their services. However, they have indicated that there, there's no substitute for uh, in-person worship. And uh, they've all been very good in, in, in looking at those guidance that's, that's published uh, on our Arkansas Department of Health website for reopening. And I think it's been uh, pretty effective from what I've seen. Um, with that being said, I, I want to take the remaining time that we have to move into a final subtopic, and that is the topic involving the impact of this pandemic on uh, what we're seeing as lawyers in the court system. Obviously, uh, we're all doing this by Zoom. I can, I can say from personal account that I've probably taken a handful of depositions live since the last two months and probably a hundred or couple hundred depositions by Zoom. So the way we've all done things in our day-to-day -day routines as lawyers has, has certainly changed. And Jeremy, let's start with you. What have you seen in, in the court system uh, in Mississippi? Are you all having civil jury trials now? What's going on? Yeah, um, one of the, you know, you brought it up. One of the major issues in Mississippi is the lack of uh, internet connectivity that can handle video. Uh, in some of our rural areas. So that creates a problem that really delays uh, a good bit of civil litigation. However, uh, in Mississippi, we've had one civil case go to trial. Uh, it was in uh, Hancock County, which is on the coast. And one of the reasons they had it there is because they have a brand new courthouse. It's really, really big. And they had enough um, 
number one, they had enough jurors show up, and number two, they had enough uh, room to space everyone out for board hour. Now, that's the major problem that we're seeing uh, with jury trials is, number one, jurors are not showing up for jury duty, and number two, they simply don't, the courthouses simply don't have the space um, to have an adequate live board hour. Um, so they're looking at options like doing it outside or, um, and that's not very pleasant in Mississippi this time of year. Uh, they're looking at uh, renting out space and that's very expensive um, to the court system. So there's really not a good answer for uh, having live board hour. I think once you get the jury selected, uh, the jury boxes and the areas of the courtroom have adequate space in most places so they can socially distance um, responsibly so you can have a live jury trial. Um, you know, most of the problems that we're seeing here is number one, jurors not showing up for jury duty. Number two is that attorneys don't like board hiring or talking to jurors with masks on. You know, they can't see their full facial expressions. Um, uh, there's been some appeals uh, in Louisiana, I think, on they've had four jury trials reportedly um, that the, the jurors were not asked to take their mask off when they responded to questions during board hour. Um, a, a lot of judges have kind of kicked around the notion to have video board hour, and every lawyer on both sides of the, of the aisle has objected to doing video board hour because they don't believe that it's an accurate representation of what you would get live. So um, I do not believe that there's gonna be very many jury trials in state court in Mississippi until the end of the year. I, I do not believe there's gonna be any in federal court until the end of the year. And so I believe that you know December, January, these judges and these court systems are gonna to have to look at this again and make a decision you know, how long are we going to hold this off? How long are we going to delay it? You know, or if it's going to be here, uh, you know, for a, a long time, you know, we're going to have to look at different ways, you know, to have civil jury trials, or if not, the dockets will just be so crowded, you know, by March that, you know, we're just, we're not going to have jury trials until 2023. Thank you, Jeremy. Um, David, what are you seeing in uh, Georgia? Um, so we've got a question, but let's, I guess let's run through this and then we can address the question. Um, in Georgia, contrary to what, uh, the state, the governor did about trying to reopen quickly, our, our courts statewide have been shut, um, totally closed, uh, for the first couple of months, from about March to May. Um, now they've they've since reopened, but the Chief Justice of the Supreme Court in Georgia issued an emergency order um, effective March 15th, which uh, stayed all proceedings. It went even further and told all statute of limitations, uh, all deadlines, any timing issue uh, was told until the expiration of that order, which only just happened in July, uh, actually middle of July, July 14th. And so as we sit here today, we're back to the status quo of statute of limitations and discovery periods and times to file answers and so on. But for the first uh, several months of the pandemic, uh, it was just unknown. And the result has been that I, I've had a few cases that would have had nothing to do with COVID would have been uh, untimely, but uh, attorneys have taken advantage of the situation and filed cases that expired even the day after, like March uh, 16th, but filed them sometime in April. Uh, so they got themselves you know, a, a free 30 days, which was the intention. Um, and those cases, we've got no argument that they were untimely. Um, and that, so we're now back at status quo on deadlines. and cases being filed and cases being responded to and discovery happening. Uh, from personal experience, I've taken a handful of in-person depositions and I've argued both sides that I'm not comfortable doing in-person for my client. Uh, but on the other side, I, I insist on taking uh, a specific witnesses deposition in person. There's no rule governing that. It's we're advised to be professional in working those issues out. Um, as far as 
jury trials, well, hearings before jury trials, so court proceedings that are not jury trials. Um, we can get a judge to set a hearing date on a motion. I've had a couple of in-person motions. Um, I've even had, I had an in-person bench trial last week. Um, so things are moving forward. The docket is obviously slammed. Uh, and, you know, let alone that s several of the courts, depending on the jurisdiction, are now inundated with the COVID effects of the eviction proceedings and so on. Um, so the docket slammed. Jury trials are, have not started back and will not start back until probably the earliest would be December of this year. Uh, our local jurisdictions here outside of Atlanta, I've heard, the earliest I've heard, which is speculation, but it's from a judge, um, was that we will see a jury trial in the summer of 21. Um, the the, the, the uh, Chief Justice's order has touched on that. He, he released an updated order um, last week, actually, that um, says that there's going to be a panel put in place with various legal system participants, who I guess would be judges, clerks, maybe some lawyers, to try to figure out how we can move forward and conduct jury trials. Uh, like Jeremy said, and like folks are probably going to say after me, it's really going to depend on the courthouse, the venue, uh, and what the how big how big the place is, how big the jury pool is, all that stuff. But there's been no jury trials, and there will not be for at least a few more months. Um, so it's it's interesting uh, to see. And of course, you know this this is one of those things that we all have plenty of time to discuss. But the next interesting thing that I'm going to be that we're all dealing with now is how is this, and is it uh, pushing quicker resolution in cases um, from both sides? So Ted, Jason, whoever's up next. Uh, Paul, what are you seeing in Maryland? In Maryland, our courts were closed from March to July. They have reopened. Um, we have an interesting split because a few of our largest population centers like Baltimore City, Prince George's County, and Montgomery County are not electronic filed jurisdictions yet. Um, Prince George's County and Baltimore City essentially asked council to stop <coughs> filing anything. Um, during the pandemic because they were trying not to have staff appear in the courthouse at all. What they did was they put out a, an, an agreement essentially that said, don't file anything. If you need time later, liber uh, continuances will be liberally granted. Uh, earlier this week, I attended a, a, a court conference, all of which I've attended to date have been virtual. Uh, I've received a jury trial in June of 2022 at that conference. Um, in one of our jurisdictions, Prince George's County, which is was already heavily backlogged, but now is overwhelmed. Uh, they've been holding status conferences for cases that are coming up. Um, it, usually you're asked two questions. One, how many jurors do you think you're going to need? If it's more than 30, you're almost certainly going to be pushed back until the summer of 2021. If it's going to be a panel of 30 or less, the question is whether or not council will agree to do voir dire by Zoom. If anyone says no, it's automatically postponed as well. Um, we have some courts that are doing in-person hearings nowadays, but most are still doing them by conference um, or, or by video conference or conference calls. Um, the general rule is if anyone who's required to be at a conference expresses any concern about COVID-19 and being in person, they can file a request to have it done by Zoom. And depending upon the court schedule, it'll either go by Zoom that day or it will be postponed. Um, I understand we've had one federal court jury trial done by Zoom. Our state courts are not doing jury trials yet. Those won't resume until after October. Um, because our public schools are out, it's an interesting um, dilemma because some of our counties, and we go county by county on this topic, say that there's no jury trials if schools are out. Well, schools are out, so the schools are in, but they're technically out because the children are at home. So in that way, um, those jurisdictions have not yet announced how they plan to handle this, the, this distance learning in school and whether or not jurors have to 
um, show up. I think that probably both Jeremy um, and David already talked about this. Most of our courthouses are not big enough to handle large panels. Um, and so one of our jurisdictions, Baltimore County, asked uh, one of our um, state colleges whether or not they could use their basketball arena to do voir dire, and the school said no. Frankly, they didn't want to have to then be responsible for all of the cleaning requirements that would have resulted from bringing multiple jurors into their gymnasium purely to benefit the court system and having nothing to do with the students who are, who um, who would otherwise be using the gymnasium. So, um, the long and the short of it is, I think that we're going to be um, finding that we're in a log jam until probably late spring, early summer next year, where every every jurisdiction, is, as you all probably will experience the same, is trying to get jur jury trials on the calendar all at the same time to try to catch up for things that have been, um, been pushed back. I think to David's point, my experience has been varied. I have had some plaintiffs take settlements that I thought they would never take that were lower than expected because they knew that they'd be waiting for a year. Um, others haven't seemed to, to react in the same way. So I think we'll, we'll see you know, how all that works out. Thank you, Paul. Ted, I know that uh, nothing including COVID can stop a Waldeck firm defense win. So what's going on up there? Yeah, uh, I'm going to be brief, uh, Jason. I see David Foss sent us in a question. It's a good one, uh, and we're, I think we're getting low on time anyway. But I can tell you, uh, my office, my brother who I practice with just tried a case uh, now two weeks ago in Chippewa Falls, Wisconsin. Th that goes along with what I had said earlier about Wisconsin taking this patchwork approach that's been county by county. So the, the, the judge there just decided they were going to move forward with the trial. Precautions were put in place. The jury was in the gallery spread out behind them, which I think was bizarre to do, um, it, bizarre to be a part of. Uh, but nevertheless, they were able to get through it in a reasonable amount of time. Uh, to those who may be interested, we did get a defense verdict on that case, no liability, no damages. Uh, I don't know if that had anything to do with COVID or it was likely the result that the plaintiff was a uh, drug-seeking individual who maybe wasn't even really injured. That could have been part of it as well. Um, in any event, uh, what we're noted, what I'm seeing now, the, to the extent that the trend is changing from everything which was closed down on the civil end, is now judges are at least telling us to be ready. I have a trial here in Minneapolis scheduled for December, and we're being told that's going to happen. I'm not certain whether or not that's accurate if they're being straightforward with us, but what's clear is judges are getting the directive to move things along. Uh, I think with the hopes of civil litigants are going to resolve these things short of trial on their own, but they need the threat of a, a trial date. Um, from our standpoint, from a practice standpoint, I just think it's important for us to continue to move things along uh, regardless, as a lot of these things can still be accomplished, whether the courts are open or not. Um, so I'll turn it over. I, we're, we're short on time. Like I said, I want to get to the question. Okay. Uh, as far as Arkansas, we our state courts kind of do their own thing. Um, I've got a trial next month. Uh, our state judges are elected. Those that uh, intend to be reelected uh, obviously are not going to require folks to come into their courtroom for jury duty with the high case count still ongoing. Uh, so uh, uh, we've seen uh, uh, reluctance in central Arkansas. In fact, all of the jury trials scheduled for 2020 have now been taken off the docket, and those are all being rescheduled uh, 2021 to 2022. Um, I see the question from uh, David Foss. I'm going to read it to the group. Do you foresee any plaintiff argument that conducting services or holding in-person schooling would rise to the level of ultra-hazardous activity for purposes of establishing absolute liability if illness related to participation may be proven, despite any assumption of risk argument? Uh, great question, David. Uh, the U.S. is actually uh, there is a class action currently against uh, China uh, for this COVID uh, outbreak and the ultra hazardous uh, activity is one of the claims that we're asserting 
uh, against China. As far as anything in Arkansas, uh, that theory and argument has not been raised. Uh, in Arkansas, the only thing similar uh, along these lines would be a, uh, a established precedent involving herbicides being sprayed uh, on crops and, and people, and there's case law and precedent uh, in which that is deemed to be a legal issue and uh, the courts have decided that that does not raise to an ultra hazardous activity. Whether the courts would find the same uh, with respect to COVID exposure is unknown, but that would be the, the precedent that would be argued back and forth by both sides. And I'll turn it over to the other panelists if they have any ideas on uh, David's question. Uh, I'll just jump in to the question of can we foresee a plaintiff doing it? I think everybody would agree. Uh, we, we could certainly foresee a plaintiff making that argument. I wouldn't put anything past anyone. Um, ultra hazardous, I think, will end up being a fact specific um, issue. I, I think it, it's, it's, I would say my guess is it's unlikely, but we don't know. Um, but obviously, if a place is taking precautions, is following guidelines like we talked about, I think it would be difficult to really survive maybe even a rule 12 on ultra hazardous. Uh, but recently, I mean, just the other day, there was a, a priest out of La Crosse, Wisconsin, who was proclaiming that COVID is made up and is not real and people need to get back in church. Um, to the extent you have a situation where somebody is, is presenting a more dangerous situation, taking no precautions whatsoever, you may have a closer call, but, uh, but ultra hazardous, at least in Minnesota and Wisconsin, is typically reserved for extreme cases. Yeah, I, I would agree with that. Yeah, um, I agree with Ted. Um, I mean, if, I mean, I never doubt the, the, uh, uh, revolutionary filings or theories that the plaintiff's bar in Mississippi is going to make on any type of claim. But um, I think if you have a governor of a state saying you can reopen, I think that's going to take it out of the, the negligence per se type of uh, arguments. And if you're just, just willfully not having squat, you know, in terms of guidelines and you just got people just doing crazy stuff up in schools and churches, I think you're going to be safe. Yeah, my thought would be that I just think as a matter of public policy, I'm not sure courts would want to extend COVID-19 to an ultra hazardous activity because the extension of liability wouldn't be just to churches and schools, it would be to any business <clears throat> that chose to open during COVID-19. So I would think, first of all, um, in Maryland, ultra hazardous activities are pretty limited to begin with, but I just think as a matter of public policies, it would be very difficult for a court to say they're going to permit an action to move forward on this topic because the floodgates of litigation at that point would be just um, uh, unimaginable um, at that point. I also think that um, I don't know that someone could establish this is just my personal hunch. How could you establish ultra hazardous activity if you've got a federal government agency and the CDC telling you how you can open up. So to the extent that you've got the, you know, you've got the authority in the country telling you that you can open businesses, how could it ultimately then turn out to be an ultra hazardous, hazardous activity to do so? Yeah, and in Georgia, it's, it's, it would, it's very similar outcome would be my guess. Uh, it's, the plaintiff's bar could get to willful and wanton before they get to ultra hazardous and willful and wanton would be all they need based on the current orders here and the general state of tort law. Right. Well, um, on behalf of Ted and, and our panelists, uh, Brotherhood Mutual folks, we want to thank you. And uh, that's our time. We're going to go ahead and turn it back over to Dan. Thanks a lot, Jason. Thanks, guys. Appreciate your hard work. You know, usually I uh, get up to Indiana. I went to the University of Notre Dame, so usually in the fall I get up to Indiana three or four times during the fall. Turns out this fall this will be my only visit to Indiana. Who would have thought it would be virtual? Um, we've enjoyed putting this on for you very much and have uh, appreciated you letting us come in and, and talk to you. Please keep in mind that, you know, our Eagle members are available for you anytime that you want to speak with them. Just pick up the phone, call the person in the state that, that you need to get information about. We're always there for you. 
and uh, we look forward to, to serving you in the future. So thank you again for joining us. Uh, all of us here at Eagle are, are enthusiastic about putting these programs on and interacting with you. Uh, so if you have any feedback for us, please let us know. Reach out to us at the website at www.eagle-law.com or to any individual uh, that is a, a member. Uh, we're happy to talk with you, happy to get your input, any feedback, criticism you may have. If you have questions about the program, ideas about future conferences that you'd be interested in, uh, we're happy to uh, engage and talk with you about that. So thank you again for joining us. We hope you enjoyed it. We look forward to seeing you soon. Thank you.